are very excited to have so many student teachers, regular teachers, um, joining us today to collaborate and learn how to integrate technology into your teaching. Our focus today is on putting technology into the hands of students. And we are very excited to welcome Craig Vidura as our keynote um, address speaker today. So inspiring us today as we explore the way our students are growing up digital is keynote speaker Craig Vidura. An innovative educator, Craig serves as the pre-K-12 integration specialist for Aurora Public Schools in Aurora, Nebraska. He provides a wealth of teaching experience and technology experience having served the first 11 years of his career as a social studies teacher and then K-5 media integration specialist. His passion is integrating technology in the classroom and finding best ways to utilize the many technologies in schools for both teachers and students. If you Google Craig Madura, you'll find him widely followed under Twitter and all social media. Lifted up as an innovator with Kid Blog and other specific digital tools, contributing on the Nebraska Educational Technology Association, the NEDA board, and as a presenter very often, and presenting to teachers and aiding schools and districts in one-to-one -one initiatives. He describes himself as dad, husband, son, teacher, pre-K to 12 technology integration specialist, reader, gardener, golfer, and today, keynote presenter. Please join, join me in welcoming Craig Medora. Thank you. you. You did your homework. How many of you have Googled yourself lately? <laughs> Boy, I'm glad I did that and put good stuff out there. We'll talk more about that later on. I think we need to give these two a round of applause, Lori and Guy, for finding a great day for us. I'm honored to be here, and it was really hard for me to, I think, when it was it about November, you'd ask me, Craig, would you come keynote? And I'm like, what do I know? I just do my job. And so it was really hard for me to make that decision because I had to tell those kids that I wouldn't be in their classroom this morning. Are there any teachers in here that are kindergarten teachers or are going to be kindergarten teachers? Let's give them a round of applause, please. Because I have, oh, about 60, and we've split up now. We did a lot of digital citizenship to start the year at Aurora. And now second semester, we get to do a lot of integrating with technology with them. But those are my three classes, and they were kind of disappointing because we get to meet every Monday morning at 8.30. And God bless you if you're going to be a kindergarten teacher because I struggle keeping them engaged for 30 minutes. And when you have to try to keep these guys engaged all day, all day long, but literally I do have the best job in the world. I get to work with uh, preschool through seniors. I love my kindergartners. I can't think of a better job or a better way to start your week every week with kindergartners, and it really just, because it's about what teaching is about, is making relationships with kids, isn't it? I mean, we're going to be talking about technology today, but as I'll talk about in the future here, technology is just a tool. It's about building relationships with your students. So people ask me, well, my story, I guess, it starts about 15 years ago in education. I was a social studies teacher. I uh, spent a couple years at York as a media specialist, and then Aurora was going one-to-one -one iPads. They had a change of administration, and the administrator wanted to go one-to-one -one iPads, and their technology committee said, we want to go... Uh, with iPads, we'll do it, but we need somebody to teach us how to use that. And I, I'm thankful that Aurora said, hey, we're going to hire an integration specialist. And if you've been looking at jobs, you're starting to see that as starting to pop up because you can't just throw the devices in teachers' hands. They need to know how to effectively use that. So uh, that's another great job perk of mine is I get to work with awesome teachers and, and the kids. And so we have about, we rolled out uh, grades 6 through 12. We went one-to-one, -one, about 400 iPads, and then we have probably another 250 and grades K through five at the elementary. So people ask me, what do you do as an integration specialist? And really all I do is teach kids how to take selfies like I do in first grade right here because that was the word of the year last year. But in all reality, as Lori had asked me, talk about devices in the hands of kids. Yes, that's me in fourth grade. And if some of you relate to this, how many of you are student teaching right now? Do you have that one student in your class that's a hellion. That is that kid that you're like, that kid, I will never ever use that name to name one of my children. <laughs> that was me. And if you don't believe it, how many Craigs do you know that are under the age of 42? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I rest my point. So I was thinking, what did I have for tools and technologies when I was in third and fourth grade and when I was a kid growing up? Anybody? Can you relate to any of those right there? 
Okay, so I'm thinking, wow, how has it changed in 30 years of growing up? Look how technology has changed. And I'll fast forward, you know, from my second, first grade years to my sixth grade year. And I remember at Centura, I was in sixth grade. Anybody old enough to remember? Mm -hmm. Yes, the Apple IIe. So we would have to sign up. And this was a big deal. I mean, our school was pretty progressive at the time. We had a whole lab of these. The, the principal was very... I mean, he was tech savvy back in the day. This, is, this had to be 83, 82. And so we would sign up to get to play Lemonade Stand on the 2E. <laughs> wow. I look back and go, wow. That was amazing that we would sign up to, do, to play with that machine right there. Now look at what kids have. I was just having a conversation after Christmas with one of our third graders after I was in their classroom. He said, Mr. Badura, I got an iPhone 5 for Christmas. A third grader. And I said, how did you get the iPhone 5? Well, my mom upgraded to the 5S, so she just gave me her 5. And we'll talk more about this as I'll give you some thoughts and tidbits. But I was really, my, my biggest challenge in my job is educating parents. Because as Kevin Honeycutt, as you guys heard of Kevin Honeycutt before, I love the quote that he says that we're turning kids blue. It's like kids are on a digital playground and there's not a teacher on duty. And so we have to best teach, not only kids, but teachers as well, how to use some of these devices. So I'm gonna share a little bit about my story with you. I was, uh, right out of college, I didn't get a teaching job. I was a, uh, the Parks and Recreation Director for the City of St. Paul. And a couple years after that, I went out on a whim and I applied at my old alma mater for a social studies job. And boy, was I happy when I got that job in 1999. I spent literally half my summer taking the notes from the previous teacher, putting them into a Microsoft Word document. And I thought that was pretty cool because he had had all of those notes handwritten and he was using the overhead with the crank on it. And he would do that and he'd have a little wet paper towel there. So I typed all those up and I thought I was using technology because I took those to the copy machine and made them into what? transparencies with the font on there. And then I'd put the piece of paper right up on the overhead. Remember how your teacher would do that? And then you'd have to handwrite notes. And that was my technology in my classroom. So I used the overhead projector. 1999, I was loving it. I thought I was doing a great job. I was teaching the way I was taught. And I thought I was doing a good job. Then Mr. Brown, he was my elder teacher and I had had him in school. He came over and showed me Microsoft PowerPoint. Wow. That was a life-changing moment for me because I was now engaging kids with all these animations and things were coming to the screen. But really, I don't think I was doing a very good job. I remember it hit me one day, we were studying about Islam with my freshman. And here we were, we were taking notes, we were reading out of the book, and I was in the back of the room and I just said to myself, you're not getting through to these kids. You're teaching the way you were taught. You are boring. That was really for me, that really hit home for me. I was teaching the way I was taught, and a lot of you will start that way because you are going to, just as, as parents, our kids will do things that we do. If you're texting and driving, I'm always telling your parents, put your phone away. Your kids are modeling that behavior. And so I picked that up and thought I was doing a good job, but really, my class was boring. I was teaching social studies. Right now, my kids don't like social studies. And I'm like, how do you not, how many of you like social studies in school? Be honest. You didn't. How can you not like social studies? Because really, history's awesome, isn't it? It's a great story, but you, you just didn't like the way it was taught to you. How many of you had a really awesome history teacher? Okay, they made it entertaining, made it fun. So really, my story changed in about 2000, I would say about 2003, 2004. Principal superintendent by the name of Gary Monner came to me. And he said, Craig, I need you to be a leader here. I need you. We're thinking about throwing a one-to-one -one proposition out here for the school board. And I said, what do you one-to-one? -one? What do you mean? This is like when the talk was, I think Arnold Public School had gone one-to-one screen uh, 612 with their, with their MacBook Pros. And I said, one-to-one, -one, what is that? What are you talking about? He said, well, we're going to get a MacBook Pro for every single kid in grades 7 through 12. And my initial response was, are you crazy? I remember it specifically standing in that pod saying, Gary, you can't give every kid a computer. I'm the teacher in the classroom. He said, no, Craig, follow me here. You just got to get on board. You got to follow me here. Bear with me. And boy, did that transform what I was doing in my classroom. Within three months, I had my textbooks sitting in the closet. I said, if you need the textbook, it's right here. We started using Angel Learning Management System. I started using that thing all the time. Instead of just learning and reading out of the book about the, uh, the Hajj, I had my kids making itineraries, travel brochures, 
making it authentic for them, trying to have them figure out, well, how much does it cost if we were to go on the Hajj? How much, oh, Jesus, really, it's about $4,500 to go over there. Then light bulbs start clicking on the kids. Nebraska History, we were using the uh, Nebraska Studies, uh, NebraskaHistory.org website. Kids were so ingrained with that. So I was trying to reach my kids in the world that they were used to, and the devices were becoming very, very popular at that time. So I was very lucky to be in that conversation with Gary at the time, but then I started realizing that I was no longer the smartest person in the classroom. And I'm dealing with teachers on a daily basis that struggle with this point. Right now, guys, I'm gonna tell you right now, if you're student teaching, I can pretty much Google anything that you teach. Now, yes, I agree we should be teaching certain things, but how many of you raise your hand have Googled something lately to try to learn how to do something? I bet I do it five times a day in my job. How many of you have YouTube, tried to find a YouTube video to learn how to do something? Could I learn pretty much how to do anything by using the internet? Yes, I could. So now we have to start thinking, and I'm pushing some of my elder teachers and some of my younger teachers, too, to start thinking of changing the way you're teaching things. Because right now, your kids walk into the classroom, they have that device in their pocket right here. I got a pocket full of Google. So you need to make my learning authentic. How is it relevant? Our last slide will talk about making learning messy in your classroom. Make it messy. I love my, and it drove teachers nuts. They'd come and they'd slam my door. It's too noisy in your classroom. I got rid of the desks. I wanted bean bags. I had three couches in my room. Make it relevant to them. I don't like structure. I call it industrial revolutionized type of learning. When your rows are right here and you sit there and you be quiet when I'm talking, don't do that, okay? When's the last time, I can't think of, you know, when I applied for my uh, job at Aurora Public Schools, I, they didn't test me on how to, uh, how well I could do on a test. I know well, that's a whole another monster we could fight is testing. They didn't t look at my keyboarding skills. They asked me, how are you going to collaborate? How are you going to deal with this teacher? How are you going to deal with this student? So it's those collaboration uh, type skills that you're going to need to have. So what I did here, I've been in two one-on-one -on -one environments. So I'm going to give you some tips, and I could probably add about 15 to 20 more here, but I tried to narrow it down to 12, and then last night I said, I've got to add one more before I go to bed, because I had 15 originally, so I'm going to share some of my thoughts with you. And being in a one-on-one -on -one environment for four years that I taught in, and then being outside of the one-on-one -on -one environment and now trying to help teachers integrate, being not as a teacher, and not really as an admin, but you're kind of in between. So I'm gonna kind of talk to you from that perspective and, and give you some maybe some suggestions or thoughts for not only the student teachers, but the, the teachers that are active in the classrooms right now. So the first one, how many of you feel like you're drinking from a fire hose when it comes to the internet and the amount of information there? There is a plethora of information out there. It's up to you really to to pigeonhole that information, how, how you want to deal with it. Because there is, you could literally find so many different ideas for your classroom. You just have to play around. Those of you that are student teaching right now, use Evernote, put an idea in there, evaluate it, did it work well, didn't it work well. Have a collection of resources where you're going to archive these. Use Deco, you, Digo, use Evernote. Because literally, you're going to walk into your first year and you're thinking you have to integrate technology. If you're thinking you have to integrate technology, you're doing it the wrong way. It's got to be seamless in your classroom. Okay? It's just got to be like, the, I've seen somebody, uh, I saw somebody on Twitter uh, tweeted something about, it's like the oxygen in the room. Okay? Kids don't even know it's there. And we have some teachers doing an outstanding job of that with our iPads. Okay? So that's their first recommendation. The second one is when you're going to start using technology in your classroom, getting these devices into the student's hands, you have to set expectations. Now, I'll give you an example. Last year, we were getting our iPad, we rolled them out about December. And we had a lot of conversation about this, and I shared with my admin team and said, we have got to know apples up, apples down. And we all have to be on the same page. So when those kids come into the classroom, what are they going to do? They're going to sit down with that iPad, and they're going to get right on to, you think they're going to get to their homework or to the website they need to get to? What do you think those kids like to do? Facebook? What else do they like to do? They like to game. Okay, so kids like to game. Okay, so you have to set expectations and boundaries. I'm still teaching that and preaching that with my first graders. When I put an iPad in front of a first grader, it's like a Hershey's chocolate bar that's open. They just want to grab it. And so we have some certain prompts that we put hands on our lap so we know that we're paying attention. And then I try not to teach more than, oh, a minute or two, and then I let them dig into something, okay, before they have their own personal work time. But you've got to set boundaries. Think of that dog that's on the tie-up. He always wears that trail right at the end of the chain, right? And so that's what your kids are going to do. And kids like boundaries. Okay? If you go wide open 
it's just going to be a smorgasbord of bad behavior. Now, one more thing that I didn't add on here was if you're struggling with classroom management before you start using devices, it's going to get a whole lot worse when you start taking devices. Okay, I've been in classroom after classroom, after, and I've told teachers, you know what, and that's hard to tell a teacher. And when you tell them that, you know, your management wasn't very good before, we told our teachers, you've got to have strict boundaries. Move your desk from the front room to the back room. Okay? Movement. How many of you had a teacher in school that would sit at their, they'd give you the assignment, then they'd sit at their desk? We all had them, didn't we? Okay, what's wrong with moving around? Proximity, isn't it amazing how proximity, well, it can engage people, but it also makes them look like they're on task, and it creates that kind of, that uncomfortableness next to people when you get next to them. So that is really, some of our teachers are figuring that out this year. After year two, they're figuring, I have to really change the way I'm doing things in my classroom. <coughs> And one simple thing that I have is right there, movement. I had a teacher that was just furious. These kids, they're coming to ALC. It's our homeroom from about 11.30 to 12 o'clock. These kids, all they're doing is playing games. This darn iPad, darn iPad during ALC. That's all they're doing. So I make them put their iPads up on the counter when they come into classroom. I say, okay, that's fine. But Steve, what are you doing the whole time? The kids are, uh, what, are they, what are you doing when they're on the games during ALC? Well, I'm sitting at my desk. I said, well, what would you do? Okay, in that situation, I'm sure some of you right now might even be on a website that you're not engaged with me. Okay, so be it. Have a plan B. This came to fruition for us last week, and we've been telling teachers, have a plan B, have a plan B, have a plan B. Monday morning, ESU 9, the internet goes down. Last Monday, I thought the world was going to end. <laughs> it did for a while. And last Friday with Google, it did. Didn't, wasn't it last Friday with Google? But our teachers were furious. What am I going to do? See, we never should have gotten these iPads. Did you have a plan B? No, because I've been doing things the way I've been doing them for the last 23 years. Why would I change? You wanted me to use the iPad? Have a plan B. That's always very, uh, just a great recommendation for it. it happened to me too. Okay, as a teacher, you got to be the, you got to be able to fly by the seat of your pants sometime, and we can, we can kind of pass it off really well as teachers. Now, sharing. Sharing. Some of you guys are doing awesome things in your class. Who are the regular teachers here? Some of you guys, how many of you have a blog that just raised your hand? Good. Do you blog about what you're doing in your classroom and sharing? Thank you. Share what you're doing. You know, I'm going to talk about Twitter here in a second, but when we share, social media has created the world's best, most positive teacher's lounge in the world, as far as I'm concerned. You know, we're taught in kindergarten, share, 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 and then we get older and we start hoarding, hoarding, hoarding. And I was in first grade in Ms. Myers' class the other day, and I said, Angela, why don't you blog about this? Oh, it's, I've been doing it forever, and it's really not that big of a deal. And I said, this is awesome. What might be meaningless to you is magnificent to somebody else. She's like, you really think so? And I said, yes, this is a great concept. Get on social media, share. And you can also consume that information, so you can produce it and consume it. But I encourage you to consume first and then start producing. But please share, make connections, start building your PLM and your professional network immediately, and it's okay to fail. I failed on purpose last year. I had a veteran teacher, 34 years, came to me specifically and said, Craig, I'm afraid I'm going to fail in front of my students. I'm the master of content, and I'm using this device, and I don't know how to use it. I said, is it okay to have your kids teach you? No. He wasn't comfortable with that. He said, I'm not comfortable learning from a seventh grade student. And I said, we need to change that. Because when you learn from that student, that launches that kid. I've learned stuff on my iPad from a first grader. I uh, forget what it was a couple weeks ago. You know what happened when that kid, when I told him, thank you for teaching me that. I never knew that. That kid was gone. And he's like, I just, he went back to his desk. I just taught Mr. Badura how to do it. It was something with one of our apps that we're using. I never knew that. And so empower your kids, okay? We talk about constant engagement all the time. When you empower kids, you're engaging kids. And it's okay to fail. I, we do digital citizenship once a week at Aurora Middle School. And I purposely failed in front of all the seventh graders, 100 kids, so that teacher could see that. Now, I don't know. I didn't go up to him afterwards and say, did you see how I failed? Did you? I'm hoping that he got the point and said, okay, that's how Craig handled that situation. We we're learning to use Evernote, and I made a mistake on purpose. So it's okay to fail in your classroom. And it's even better to ask kids when you fail, what would you do, Christina? What would you do in this situation? Empower that student right there that you have in your classroom. 
I took this image. I hope I cited it all right, Mrs. Peters. I'm going to learn that how to do that later today. But I took this. This was a manuscript from 1650 of a classroom in 1650. So we're talking about 350 years old, this picture. Anybody think it uh, compares to any classrooms that you've been in recently? I was in a, I won't say this subject, I was in a classroom last week. Did you guys sleep in here? Yes. These guys are over here talking in the background right there. You know, laser pointer doesn't work there. Um, the social studies classroom might have a video playing there, a VHS tape, mind you, that was playing right there. We're studying about something, just pop the tape in. So, does some classrooms today look like that? Yeah. Guys, it's, it's, we got, we're, we're the change that has to happen. You guys are the younger ones. You can bring in that new generation to start changing this type of learning, because obviously I'm still seeing classrooms after 350 years. Change is hard. It's easy to do the same thing. I did it for three years with my overhead, and I thought I was the bomb until I had that revelation that one day and sitting there in the back of the room going, oh my, I'm not getting through to these kids, okay? So we have to be the change, okay? And just do little things at first. Time. How many of you ever used that excuse? I don't have time to learn Twitter. I don't have a lot, I shouldn't use Pinterest. How many of you are pinning in here? Yes, Pinterest. And some of you say, I'm not creative. Yes, you are, you're on Pinterest. Think of how awesome it was to be in kindergarten. You got to be creative and we got to paint all the time. That's what Pinterest is. That's why it's so popular. It's creativity, isn't it? Think, let your kids create your classrooms, but this drives me bonkers. I don't have time, really. Well, you're on Facebook for two hours last night. Maybe you should have gotten on Twitter and looked at the fourth chat hashtag and maybe looked up some other things that you could have used in your classroom. Maybe you should have set up a Skype or a Google Hangout with that class that was looking for a connection right there. So don't use that. I tell my teachers, you have 24 hours in your day just like I do. And they're like, Craig, how did you learn how to do that? I had a blog post I did a couple weeks ago. I played. I just picked it up. I played. Tony Vincent's new app, Stick Around, came out. I'm going to play with it this week. Okay? On the airplane, I'm taking. I'm going to Phoenix on Thursday to go to the Phoenix Open, go to the 80 degree weather. And that's my goal, is I'm just going to play on the Stick Around app and I'm going to learn it in my two hour flight to Phoenix. I'm going to learn how to use that, and I'm going to go back and show teachers. But they always, all the time, how did you learn how to do that? Well, I, I learned about it on Twitter, then I just made it on my list. And then instead of doing something else, you have to just commit time to do that. But I, I oftentimes get frustrated with that excuse. I don't have time to learn how to do that. You do have time. You just have to manage it. How many of you are connected in here? How many of you are on the Twitters in here? Okay. By the end of the day, I'd love to have everybody's hand up here. My Twitter story started about five years ago. J Dog 1990 or J Dog 90. Jamie Bullhauer, he's an, an, uh, an English teacher, integration specialist. Sandy Creek came. He was right next to me. Came to me and said, "Craig, you've got to start getting on Twitter and sharing some of these things you're doing in your classroom." I said, "What? That's like Ashton Kutcher and Demi Moore, what they had for breakfast." And I didn't get it. He said, "No, Craig, you don't get it." And I still didn't get it. I said, "Ah, oh, I'll sign up," but I was afraid to use my real name. And I use GLF, because I'm an avid golfer, golf any one, all any, because I didn't want to use my real name on the internet. I was afraid to put myself out there on the internet. And obviously, we know that I'm now. You can Google me and find a plethora of information about me. But I started just lurking, and I started consuming and following the stream. And I thought, oh, that guy was cool. Oh, Christina, that's how I met Christina right here in the front row. Oh, she has some good stuff going on. And then I started following somebody else. And all of a sudden, my stream started making sense. And I'm really like, oh, there's a good article. Oh, they have a chat once a week, the fourth chat. Hang out with the fourth grade teachers sometime on Twitter. Holy smokes, you want to learn awesome things that they're doing in their classrooms. And the great thing about Twitter is you're learning all these things that can be applicable to all grade levels. So get yourself connected. Use Twitter. How many of you are Facebook users? OK, a lot. Let's see Twitter one more time. Okay. I had a friend explain to me once, and I think it was Beth Still had, had talked to me at Need a couple years ago, and said, I said, okay, I don't do Facebook, Beth. What's, what's your idea on Facebook? What is it? Facebook, Twitter, what do I, I'm, I'm big into Twitter now. I love it. I use it all the time. She said, well, Twitter is, uh, Facebook is for all your old high school friends, and Twitter is for all the high school friends you wish you would have had. Yeah. And so it really is for me because I, I, I was always going to cap my followers, the people I was going to follow on Twitter, at like seven or 800. I think I'm up to like 2,300 now because I'm like, holy smokes, this is like walking into the world's most positive teacher's lounge. 
Twitter has. You got NebEd Chat, you got NebEd EDU, you got California Ed Chat was happening last night. We talk about certain topics that are hot in education. You're getting all these great ideas in your classroom. Get to their student teachers. Start branding yourself. With our, with our high schoolers right now, our freshmen through uh, seniors, we meet in a four week rotation. I get them for 30 minutes. And I'm talking about our seniors right now, even our freshmen, we talk about branding yourself. Make an about me page. Anybody have an about.me page in here? What about a review, re.du, or follows, I think it's follows me. You start controlling some of the information people are gonna see. Lori found out a ton of information about me by just going to my about me page, Google search, click on images. What are people gonna find when they Google you? I was just doing my digital citizenship presentation at uh, Cedar Bluffs Public Schools before their one-to-one -one rollout in August, and the principal told me, he said, Craig, I had five applicants this year for a position. I threw four of them in the trash because when I Googled their name, I didn't like what I saw. They didn't fit our school culture. So he said, I literally threw them up, uh, threw them in the trash bin. Now he did say, this was kind of scary, he said Concordia, and I'll call the school out, he said Concordia has told him that they're actually starting to monitor how the parents are using social media too, to see if they want those students as a part of their school community. So something to be cognizant of as you're using social media. So if you're a student teaching right now, start getting into hashtags, I can help you, I can sit with you, give you some recommendations if you go to the digitaldogpound.com, click over on the Aurora Huskies hashtag. Great way to brand yourself. You control that information. Now, not all of it, but it's a great way to, uh, to control that information about you. But you will make so many connections. Last week, we Skyped with the Science of a Sled Dog, Denali National uh, Forest in Alaska, 3,500 miles, with our third graders. Park Ranger, right there, talked to us for 50 minutes. Engaging lesson. Where did I find out about it? Right here. Mystery Skypes. Awesome experience for your classroom. You want to engage 23 kids for about 15 minutes and empower them and let them do everything. Do a mystery Skype. You'll find teachers all over the world wanting to do that with you. We Skyped at the National uh, uh, Civil War Museum. Didn't even know it existed last year. And I sent a tweet out and somebody said, check out the National Civil War Museum. Look at their blog. They were offering free Skypes, 35-minute uh, Skypes. And so we had a teacher who was retiring after 35 years. He said, I kind of want to go out bang with technology. What can we do? And I said, let's do a Skype. And so I asked the national, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the National Civil War Museum, would you do a Skype with us? Oh yeah, totally. There he was, turned the camera on, dressed in full uniform with relics out of their museum right there showing the kids. And those eighth graders were like this for 50 minutes. And they didn't say a word. Try to get eighth graders to sit still for 50 minutes. Get engaged, use it professionally. Now some people say to me, should I have a personal account and a professional account? Some will disagree, I say no. You are, you're who you are, right? And some of your school districts will block this. Last time I checked, we're in the education business. Why are we blocking things? Kids are gonna use these tools. I have four teachers at our school that have, school, that have a classroom hashtag. They hand in assignments via Twitter. Why would they do that, okay? AHS, our, excuse me, our, our, our Span Stew Chat. Our teachers, our Spanish teachers, are rock stars. They watch Sci Stew Chat, which they bring in scientists and a teacher on the East Coast, and they get to have a Twitter chat. Last month it was about brains. Our kids, we had 15 kids in there last week, so our, or last month, our Spanish teacher said, we want to start something. So they started a website, they call it Span Stew Chat. The first one was last Tuesday evening. They had about 25 kids. They had two or three from the East or West Coast, but I told them, beware, this is going to get bigger. And they're just talking about topics that are happening in their classroom, showing students the value of getting connected. And you know, one of my biggest pieces of advice, teachers, just try it. You just got, we lose that courage as we get older. Everything's nice and warm and fuzzy and cozy and we like it and we don't like to change, but sometimes we have to jump off that cliff. So I encourage you to jump off of that and it's okay to grab a student's hand and have them jump with you because they love to teach teachers. Creativity. Pinterest people, raise your hand. I love Pinterest, but I have to stay away from it because I can be on there 24 hours a day pinning all day long because it encourages creativity, doesn't it? How many of you have tried a Pinterest project? Has anybody ever failed on a Pinterest project? Did you tweet it with the Pinterest fail hashtag? Put that into Twitter sometime, it's kind of fun. I think it's Pinterest fail. Some hilarious, they do the original one that's beautiful and then this one that just looks like a blob of, yeah. It's hilarious, Pinterest fail, search your hashtags, but encourage creativity. Don't have your classroom look like that. That's why I said I had three couches, bean bags, my tables were all over the place, we were changing. I didn't have a seating chart, unless I had a really, really naughty kid like me then I would maybe put them over where I knew that they could work well with others. But 
Encourage creativity in your classroom. One of my favorite assignments, we were studying the, the Greeks, and we would study Greek architecture. Well, I could have them go ahead and, me and, and uh, memorize the three different type of Greek columns, but I thought, you know what, how can I get these freshmen, these 14-year-olds engaged? So I sat one night and I said, okay, I'm gonna give them an envelope, 12 sheets of paper, 12 thumbtacks, six rubber bands, a roll of scotch tape, what else did I put in there? Uh, some scissors, and they all got their manila packet. They were on their, on their table. I had the directions for them on Angel. Talked to them. We're going to learn about the Greek columns today, but we're going to also have a little contest. Now, here were the three types. By the end of the period, you have to have a blueprint for me, and you also have to have, uh, your, you have to use your 12 sheets of paper, and you have to make columns, because we're going to have a test at the end. We're going to test the weight of those. You know what? Those kids remembered those three types of architecture versus me just sitting up there putting bullets on a PowerPoint and saying these are the three types of, architect or of architectural columns. Those kids had a blast, and some of the blueprints were pretty awesome. And I had a timer right up there. I just used the big, huge uh, timer that you find on the internet. Uh, I can't remember the, the uh, big online stopwatch or something like that. Put it up there, and they knew it. They liked working because it was kind of competitive. And I'm going to talk more about the competition aspect here in a little bit. But the biggest thing I think you need to do in your schools is digital citizenship. Huge proponent. As I said before, like, like Kevin Honeycutt said, your kids are growing up on a digital playground, and a lot of times there's not even a, uh, a, anybody, not even a pair on duty. Now think of how many of your kids have devices that go home and they just download apps. What happened to Snapchat December 27th? Anybody see what happened there? Who has Snapchat in here? I do. I don't. Did you check your, what happened on December 27th? Anybody see that? They got hacked. Did you check to see if your account was hacked? Five million people. Did anybody find out if your account was hacked? And so I was sharing this with the kids the other day. All my freshmen, I had 12 girls courageous enough to come up afterwards. Last Pass has a website that you can actually go up and check to see if your account was hacked. I could go to snapchat.db.info right now and go in and put my username and it'll show up if my information was there. It basically gave up your phone number and your username. Now, they blurred out the last two digits of your phone number, but I don't think it would be very hard to figure that out. But five million people's accounts were compromised. These kids just go sign up for things and they give it permissions. They never check their privacy settings right here. But I would highly encourage you to do that because now you're more apt to getting some phishing scams going on on your phone. So I told our kids, check to see if you were, scam if you were scammed. And we spend once a month with our kids at the high school level talking about digital citizenship. And there's a kid, if you go to my blog, it's comfortably20.blogspot.com. Steal the idea, take it in your schools. That's my kit right there. So I love using little trinkets when I'm talking. I even use it with our seniors. All the way down to preschoolers, talking about the toothpaste. When you, you, if you, when you put something on the internet, you can't get it back in. Uh, talking about keeping it clean, the strainer, being too connected. So if you go to my blog, it'll talk about uh, each one of those and the analogy, the story behind each one of those little trinkets right there, the bar of soap, keeping it clean. But I like to use those because I think it makes it stick a lot more with the students there. So please make sure that you spend a considerable amount of time talking about digital citizenship. Common Sense Media has a great curriculum. That's what I use mine. I'd even be willing to share some of the stuff that I make because I just use Common Senses and uh, uh, kind of modified it to fit my needs. Let's just have a little contest here. Let's see if you guys, how well you know some of your apps that your students are using. Upper left hand corner camera is? FaceTime. Instagram. Instagram users. Could I use Instagram in a classroom? Yes. Do you think that would be an engaging activity for your kids? We had a sixth grade teacher, and they're not supposed to be, they're supposed to be 13 use Instagram, so she said, I really want to do an Instagram project in a reading classroom. So here's what she did. She used the Pit Collage app, and we went in and we had the kids use Pit Collage, which is a wonderful app. Their creativity is unlimited with that app. And we said, I wonder if we could make the, the streaming profile look like Instagram. Within 10 minutes, you should have seen what some of our kids created. It looked, they were looking for the refresh. They Google, or, and within Pit Collage, you can search for pictures from the web. The refresh button, they had it right there. Kids drag it in there for creating. It was silent in that classroom. And then she told them, here's what I want you to post. You had the like button there. What's going on? It was the book, um, or the road to Birmingham, or something like that. So they had to post 12 different pictures along the way. Kids love that project. And do we have kids that are under 13 on Instagram at Aurora Public Schools? Yeah, I got third graders that are on Instagram. That scares me. Okay. Anybody know the P one? No. Nobody. Okay. It's feed. 
I, yeah, so somebody did that one. That's, they, I haven't done it yet, but they said it's kind of an inst uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. It's kind of a hybrid of all of those. Kick Messenger. You guys know that one? I don't say a lot of good things about that. Kick and Instagram. Mm, not a good combination. Okay, so just go into Instagram sometime. Put in selfie. Last night there were 62 minutes. Just scroll through some of those. You don't think we need to do digital citizenship in our schools? Put selfie in the search. Ooh, I just want to tell some of our kids. And our kids are going to make mistakes, but they'll learn from their mistakes. Let's see. We've got the messaging app. Let's skip down to this one right here. Anybody know what that one is? Path. Path. Not Pinterest, it's Path. I was alerted that one day. I was in a classroom, uh, and one of the students' notifications went off, and I'm like, Pinterest? And I'm like, oh, no, that's not. It was Path. And I learned a little bit about, more about Path. It's kind of like a Twitter, trying to be Twitter-like-ish. Text Now, a lot of our younger kids will use that. Vining? Could I use Vine in the classroom? You bet you could. How about make six-second Shakespeare videos? Go, go, go to five minute, Google Five Minute Film Festivals. Edutopia has some great examples of how teachers are using Vine in their classroom. Home Depot is using Vine. I saw one of their vines had a piece of plywood. It had a stripped out screw, a rubber band, and a screwdriver. And I'm like, where's this going? How to, how to get a stripped out screw in less than six seconds. Take the rubber band, put it across the stripped out screw, takes that six second video just like that, and they're using social media. You can use it in your classroom, okay? It's relevant, you can do that. To draw something, Snapchat, we talked about that. I don't know, I'm still struggling with the way to use Snapchat in the classroom. So if anybody comes up with a great idea, let me know. Voxer, very, very popular amongst your younger children. If you're going to be a uh, third to sixth grade, you're going to see kids using that app, okay? Kind of like the walkie-talkie app. Facebook and then Skype. Skype and Google Hangouts, you guys, demolishes the walls in your classrooms. Get a Skype account. Get a Twitter account. Use the mystery Skype hashtag, mystery hangout. Go to eduhangouts.org. Brent Catlett, an Omaha instructional tech, uh, tech trainer, awesome guy, started Edu Hangouts. I don't know what I can do with my Google Plus account. Get on Brent's website and hook it up. Go hook your kids up with somebody else. You're studying the southern states, go Google a class down there. We just have a Skype set up on Wednesday with our friends in San Diego in first grade. My first grade teacher finally took the plunge and she tweeted, I'm looking for a first grade class because she loves San Diego. She wants to move there when she retires to set up connections with KidBlog. And I said, okay. I saw she tweeted it. I retweeted it copied Holly Ed Tech Diva, and there was another teacher out in California. Within 15 minutes, she had two teachers said, I'll do it. And so within a week, we set up a Skype with those kids. 98% of those kids in San Diego had never seen snow before. You know, as a first grader that's grown up seeing snow, making snowmen, our kids were like, what? You haven't seen snowmen before? That was amazing to see that. We have a fifth grade teacher. She's working with a, stu or with a, a group of students and another teacher in Manhattan, in downtown Manhattan. The school is right there. Tuition to that school, $38,500 a year. Fifth grade. Wow. When you tell that to our fifth graders, they're like, what? That's more than college. So make those connections. Make, it, make that, off that learning authentic in your classroom. Last slide that I'll cover here, and we're going to play a little game here in a second, but let them play. Make learning messy in your classroom. Best thing I ever did. Get rid of the desks. This drives me nuts, and I'm ADHD. Okay, kids would always come up to my desk and move stuff around, but I love letting my kids make different learning areas. Do simulations in your classroom. We had a six-week Lewis and Clark simulation that I had kids producing things that I was like, are you kidding me? Holy smokes, and it was all hands-on. I gave them the prompt. They had to problem solve. They had to collaborate. If you're a history teacher or a social studies teacher, there are tons of great simulations for you out there. So I encourage you to let that learning be messy. And the last thing that I'm probably going to leave you with here today before we get in our game is I'll have countless people will email me. They'll, they'll uh, hit me on Twitter and say, Mr. Badura, what's the best app? I just had a blog from the UK said, we'd like, you, we'd like you to write a blog post for us on the four best apps you think there are that teachers have to have. And it's you, you guys right here. I think back, think back to your favorite teacher. Think for a second here. Think to your favorite teacher. Now I got three, I'm talking so I can tell you my three. Mine was Mrs. Tillery, fourth grade. I would say Mrs. Martin in kindergarten. And Mrs. Alexander, she was smoking hot. She was my music teacher in fifth grade. That's the only one I remember. That's fifth grade, it's a long time ago. 
Sorry, Miss Alexander, if you're watching, but she's retired now. Um, but anyway, you know what? How, you know how much technology those teachers used? We're talking 1978, 79, uh, 82 early. I'm dating myself. You know how much technology they used? Zero. Think of that teacher that you're thinking about right now. Okay? You are the one that's going to make the relationships. That's what teaching's about. It's not about these devices that we all have right here. It's about you building those relationships with kids. So I encourage you to go out there, change the world, because you are the ones that can literally do that. Now, I'm big with the gaming aspect. Okay? So I'm going to end there, but we're going to get into a game now. And I, this, I, I found out about a month ago, and it's called Kahoot. Okay, so I'm going to switch screens here in a second, and we're going to play. We're going to play a Kahoot. If you have an iPad, if you have a uh, laptop, go to Kahoot.it right now. If you have an iPad, scan that. If you have an iPad, get your QR scanner out. QR codes, by the way. You put a QR code in front of a kindergarten or first grader. Wow, amazing. We're doing some pretty cool things with our kindergartners, but scan that. That should take you to Kahoot.it. This is your game pin right there. I'll go to the website and show you how to set this up. If you're student teaching right now, you go into class this week and do this, or next week, your kids are gonna be screaming, do it again. <laughs> Mr. Herman, I went in your class, what, two, three weeks ago, you're using it probably a couple times a week? Kids love this. You have a set of iPads. The great thing is you don't have to have iPads, any device. Okay, so we're gonna to go to kahoot.it, enter your name for your nickname, and then I'm going to switch screens here. Did everybody get the QR code scanned? Oh, it's not? Okay, let's go back here. I'm gonna get out. Let's go. So what I have over here, let's just let's get a new game pen. We'll do another one here. Uh game pen will be. It's the website's getkahoot.com. They're based out of England. They're awesome. I've had to uh, tweet them a couple times to get right back to you, depending on the time difference right there. 9765 is your, is your passcode. Let's try that one. 9765. Boy, I might blow the internet up. Uh, whew, I've never done it with this many people. I've done it with about 65, so we're going to see how well this works. Now, it's all based on brain-based research. Zondel is another site, if you're taking notes. Zondel. They just added another game. There's, I think, seven games now. I'm a huge proponent of kids love to compete. We like to compete, as you'll see here in a second. There's only 10 questions here. And you just put it up on the screen right here. Now I'm going to show you over here while those names are populating. This is the main website. And when I get into the website, we're going to do iconic products. I just took a random one that I found. So they're searchable. Now when I started with Kahoot about a month ago, there were about 9,000 right up here in the public. If I went to the public right here, there were about 9,000 quizzes already created. Now there's over 18,000, so it's becoming very, very popular. I've saved my seven right here. You can favorite them. So here's some that I've done with our students. I use the Internet Safety One from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. And it's 20 questions. You can control the length of the question. You can go from 5 seconds to 10 to 20 to 30 all the way up to, I think, 3 minutes. You can embed YouTube clips. If you're maybe doing, uh, in your art class, uh, what is this famous painting? It would show maybe a picture of the Mona Lisa at the Louvre in Paris, France, and then they'd have to click the right one. So here's what's going to happen. All of you are in to the Kahoot. If you get kicked out, just watch your partners here. I'm going to press launch now, or start now, and then it's going to show the question up here. Now, this one, I believe, it's going to show a picture. You have to tell me what it is. You'll see the answers down below, but then you'll see, if you look, glance at your iPad, you'll see it'll count down. Four, three, two, one. And then it's going to show the same answers. You just have to tap on your screen. So if you're on a laptop, have your mouse ready to go over to the right answer. And then it keeps track. The faster you answer, the more points you get. Okay? And it keeps track, so we'll have... Uh, I don't know what your prize is. I'm going to put Guy and Lori on the spot. They'll give you the prize if you win today. <laughs> okay, are you ready? Do we have, is this sound? Okay, so it has a little bit of sound with it too, so here's our first question. Name that toy. Okay, we don't have sound. No luck? I guess I could go down here and see if it's muted.
Is it? I'm not a PC guy, so you gotta help me. Ah, there we go. Okay, we have five seconds left. You can still tell. There we go. And and the right answer. Look on your screen. It should give you the feedback right away. Okay, let's see who. TKO, where are you at? Nobody's right there. Okay, TKO's the lead. No pressure. Here we go. Next one. Name the arcade machine. And you notice the answers are streaming in as you're. This is the 30 second question. If you do the 10 second, the music is really fast. And so you're like, Ugh. and I can't change this one because somebody already did this one. All right, let's see who's still in the lead. Hande, where you at? Yes, okay. All right, here we go. Next question. Name the computer. Good luck. And if everybody gets in before the time's done, you'll hear the gong go off and it's, it'll go, it'll show you the right answer. So we still have a couple people. It's actually holding up pretty well. I've never done it with this many people before. And hopefully everybody got that one right. Oh, we have some early guessers. Christian R. All right, you are in the lead. Here we go. Question four. Name the portable device. And I'll walk around the classroom and we have the the wireless system, so I like to read it to the kids. Oh, some of you kids won't know what this is. Some of us old fogies will know. I had one of these, this was awesome, back in the day, and now you look at iPods. But I like it, it'll give you that immediate feedback right on your device. Sony Walkman, 77, pretty good. Christian Nars, maintaining that lead through four questions. Name the car. Everybody get it? Is it holding up all right? Did it kick anybody out yet? The internet must be rock solid. 9765. I think it'll show on our neck. Was it 9765? Christian, maintaining his lead. Name the household machine. Now you can do this with anything. You don't have to add images as well. You could just have a simple multiple, so multiple choice question. Ooh. Everybody in? All right. Here we go, Christian, pulling away. Name the food. Yeah, <laughs> uh, a pair of 
I know why they're called Uggs when my wife went to buy a pair. That's what I said. Really? That much? For a pair of boots? Last one, Christian. No pressure. Don't miss it. Name the electronic device. Last question of the day, and then I'll show you what happens after you're done with the kaboot. Everybody look at them waiting. <laughs> How did we do, Christian? It's always fun, I've done this. Put your hard question at the very end, so that leader thinks, you know, they get a little cocky, and they put that hard one in there. So whoever made that one, I found that one in the public. So Christian, give Christian a round of applause. Christian won now, if you'll look at your iPad, if I go to next, it'll show. It gives that feedback now. You have to give me some feedback as a teacher. So look at your iPad or your computer right now, and you can get some instant feedback from your kids in your classroom by simply going through. If you thought it was really fun, give it five stars. If you thought it wasn't much fun, which my second and third graders will say that wasn't much fun, they'll give me one star because they didn't win. And you can go through, of course, I'll get the, smile, the sad face because I didn't win, Mr. Bruder, it was no fun. But then you can print that right up there, just an informal assessment. You can go up to the final scores. I can download that CSV file and spreadsheet. And it'll show all the kids, gives you that feedback as a teacher saying, ooh, that one, the response time was over 20 seconds. So you might have to reassess and say, I need to do a better job of teaching that concept right there. So that is Kahoot. Uh, if you go to getkahoot.com, all I did was I make a slide that looks like this, and I just have it on my desktop right down here, and I just throw in the code for the kids. I just have that uh, QR code on my desktop. It's very easy. I encourage our teachers, you want your, you're using your iPad, just have a QR code up. As soon as the kids walk in, that's your prompt right there. Kids go right to it, you're right to the website. Uh, there's a plethora of other QR sites that you can use. QR, I'll talk about this in my app smashing, but QR Beamer is a good uh, app to have on your iPad. It's free and you can create QR codes on your iPad. But that is all I have for you guys today. If you need to get in touch with me, there's my blog. You can tweet me uh, or you can contact me uh, however you want to. So thank you. Enjoy your day.